Welcome, Age of Vintage Society. One of Hollywood's first scandals was nearly its last. 1936 looked like it would be a great year for the movie industry. With the economy picking up after the Great Depression, Americans everywhere were sitting in the dark watching the stars, and few stars shined as brightly as one of America's most enduring screen favourites, Mary Astor. How Mary Astor blew up old Hollywood's juiciest scandal. Make sure to watch the video until the end and leave your thoughts in the comments. If you are new here, join our wonderful community by subscribing to the Age of Vintage channel. A stunning actress and a brilliant star on the stage, Mary Astor's immense talent hid a painful, messy private life. Despite her obvious gift for acting, Astor tried to shy away from the spotlight, and there were some unsettling reasons for that. From her dysfunctional family to her secret, ruinous affair, let's dig into the secret life of Mary Astor. Mary Astor, whose piercing eyes and finely honed features made her the quintessential star to one generation of Americans. Astor was part of the first generation of actors who more or less grew up in the studio system, and maybe for that reason she viewed movie land with a particularly cynical eye. She overcame many personal and professional challenges, from a turbulent childhood to tumultuous relationships and scandal. Astor overcame these obstacles and remained a notable star throughout her career. Transitioning from the silent era into the hurdles that the introduction of sound brought on for the film industry, Astor was consistently poised to succeed and channeled the stresses of her personal life into poignant portrayals on screen. Born Lucille Vasconcellos Langhanke in Illinois in 1906, she was shunted into modelling and acting by her ambitious parents and was signed to a Hollywood contract by the time she was 14. Both of her parents were teachers. Her father, an immigrant from Berlin, taught German. Her mother, who was half Irish, half Portuguese, contributing to her daughter's exotic beauty, taught drama and elocution. Astor participated in amateur theatricals from childhood and began sending her photographs to beauty contests as a teenager, coming close to winning several. She has almost one stopped shopping for a classic film buff. She started working in her teens and was the sole support of her greedy, abusive parents, whom she eventually had to sue for her independence. So she checks that box, see Jackie Coogan, Baby Peggy, Dickie Moore, Judy Garland and Shirley Temple et al. for variations on the Hollywood child star narrative. I was never totally involved in movies, she would later remark. I was just making my father's dream come true. She began as an ingenue in silence at 15, seeming somehow older than her years, and would soon fall head over heels for her co-star and mentor, John Barrymore, who became both acting coach and lover, so she was an eager participant in a sexual relationship with an older man who had enormous power. So, check. She survived the transition to sound, check. She was definitely part of Hollywood's film colony, and she worked with everybody in films from the most prestigious to the programmers the studios churned out to fill their bills, and with directors great and long forgotten, in movies we still watch, and those we'd never see if not for TCM. She pretty much prepared her entire life to become a movie star. Circa 1920 she modelled for photographer Charles Albin, the fruits of these sessions were spotted by a scout from famous players Lasky, and that was how she landed her contract. Her screen name was devised by a committee that included Walter Wanger, Jesse Lasky and Luella Parsons. And it's perfect, isn't it? She has this air of class, sophistication, even aristocracy. Many assumed that she was one of those Astors, but of course actual Astors had no need to become movie stars in 1920. After getting started in silence and shorts, she embarked on a career that found her drifting from place to place, always a dependable performer, but never really a breakout star. She'd been in the business 21 years before she found the role that would cement her cinematic legacy, the conniving femme fatale, Bridget O'Shaughnessy in The Maltese Falcon. Of course, her role in The Maltese Falcon was a pivotal development in film noir, Bridget O'Shaughnessy is the mother of all femme fatales, and every double-crossing murderous lady of the night owes her a debt. 
Early on in my movie-going days, I thought Asta was miscast. Maybe that's because she doesn't play the role like a femme fatale. She plays Bridget like a lady. Except, of course, for those moments when the facade drops away and she starts kicking and biting. If Asta doesn't have the raw sexual energy of a Rita Hayworth or a Joan Bennett, both of whom were contenders for the part, what she has instead is mystery. Her Bridget O'Shaughnessy is a closed book. You can never really know her because she's a woman without a centre. Bridget's speciality isn't so much lust as it is her ability to make men feel a need to protect her. In the end, the greatest temptation for Spade, in spite of every lie she's told him, is to play the sap for her. The film was a big success, and while it sent Bogart's career into overdrive, Astor went back to being a dependable performer. In 1935, with his marriage to one of Hollywood's leading ladies on the rocks, Thorpe decided the best plan of action was to search his home for his wife's diary. Allegedly acting on a tip from one of the family's housekeepers, he found the book and was shocked by what he discovered inside, a detailed and risque record of his wife's extramarital life. Since childhood, Mary's best friend had been her diary. She told it everything and delighted in writing a sublime experience while the memory still glowed. What Astor had been confiding to her closest confidant at this time were the details of her affair with New York's most famous playwright. She and her husband went to court to fight for custody of their four-year-old daughter. The trial made international news thanks to both sides' use of Astor's diary. How much did Astor truly reveal in her diary, and what role did the scandal play in her life and career? The diaries were the focus of the custody trial. Thorpe's lawyer announced that they would split the movie industry wide open, because Astor experimented with love as a scientist experiments with test tubes. Reporters vied for every detail of the mysterious diaries. When they glimpsed a page in court, they said that Astor wrote in purple ink, this detail added a level of innuendo. Purple is a colour often associated with passion. But it wasn't true. Astor wrote in brown ink, which, at a distance, took on a purplish hue, but the nickname The Purple Diary stuck. Mary was a talented, successful actress, but offset she dealt with quite a few demons. She was an abused child, and she contended with widowhood, divorce, and scandal, all the while still in her twenties. According to her daughter, Marilyn, the little girl that launched those steamy diary snippets, Mary attempted suicide at least three times, and she was not only a heavy drinker, she did her share of heavy everything. Some of her pain and experience she put on paper. In addition to two memoirs, Astor wrote novels with relatively lurid subject matter for the time. For example, in a place called Saturday, a woman is abused, conceives a child, and refuses to have an abortion. I prefer her memoirs, Mary Astor, My Story and A Life on Film, which are very readable and were bestsellers for a time. The latter book has a chapter entitled, What's It Like to Kiss Clark Gable? So I mean, come on! The salaciousness of the starlet's writing was exaggerated, and the resulting scandal arguably helped her career. She was the centre of a Hollywood scandal so big it knocked news of Hitler off the front page. Her estranged husband stole her private diaries. It was reported that Astor wrote breathless accounts of her many love affairs in its pages. As the press salivated for details, Astor appeared in court to face a hostile lawyer hell-bent on proving she was an unfit mother. People flooded the courthouse and vendors sold hot dogs and ice cream to the crowds. Astor's diary was the first major Hollywood scandal, a sensation the likes of which had never been seen before. Astor faced losing her career, daughter and reputation, but she wouldn't be shamed. When faced with these challenges, Astor fought back. In the diary, Astor described in great detail her sex trysts with a married man referred to as G. It wasn't that difficult to figure out that G referred to playwright George S. Kaufman, who had been seen taking Astor around to various hotspots during Astor's weekend jaunts to Manhattan. The public was dying to know to what G-man this theatre-going lap belonged. By 1936, Astor and Thorpe, a physician, had been married five years and shared a daughter, Marilyn. 
Both sides had had affairs. Asta wanted out of the marriage, writing in her diary, I don't love Franklin any more. I am unhappy and bored with him. But whenever she tried to leave, they had violent arguments. Our life was a series of explosions, usually over minor things, Asta wrote in her autobiography. I began to talk divorce, and the talk was considerable. The turning point came when Thorpe stole the blue ledgers Asta used as diaries. Not only did he read her real opinions of him, I feel sorry for him because I made him marry me. I play a kind of game with him. He discovered her strong feelings for George Kaufman, a two-time Pulitzer Prize winner. Kaufman was in an open marriage with his wife of twenty years, whom he had no intention of leaving. Thorpe knew about the affair, but not how much Astor enjoyed Kaufman. I am still in a haze, a nice rosy glow, she wrote. It's beautiful, glorious, and I hope it's my last love. I can't top it with anything in my experience. Thorpe demanded Astor give him sole custody of Marilyn, half of Astor's house and control of her finances. If she didn't agree, he said he'd release the diaries to the public. In the 1930s, adultery was cause for outrage, especially if committed by a woman. Banking on this double standard, Thorpe threatened to blacken her name and the names of her friends on the front pages of every newspaper in America. For the next fifteen months, whenever he and Astor clashed, he threatened to take Marilyn away. Astor alleged he also started abusing the child. Finally, Astor had enough. Her lawyer, Roland Rich Woolley, filed for custody, accusing Thorpe of blackmail and bigamy. He had a common-law wife who he continued to see after the marriage. Astor knew scandal was coming, but she wanted to protect her daughter. Kaufman, meanwhile, wanted nothing to do with the trial. When ordered to testify, he didn't show up to court. Furious, Judge Goodwin Knight put out a bench warrant for his arrest. Before the police could track him down, however, Kaufman jumped on a train to New York. The judge banned him from Los Angeles. If Kaufman comes within the jurisdiction of this court, I will see that he is put in jail and kept there long enough to cool his heels, he told the courtroom. The warrant was dismissed in 1937, and Kaufman was able to work in Hollywood again. On the stand, Thorpe's infidelities were revealed. In addition to the common-law wife, he had an affair with a showgirl named Norma Taylor, who once chased Thorpe with a carving fork in front of Marilyn. Initially, Thorpe denied the romance with Taylor, but Woolley produced a photograph of them kissing, prompting Thorpe to admit that Taylor came to his house, drunk, wearing silk, lounging pyjamas. She smashed a window with a candlestick and chased him around with a large fork. She tried to lock herself in the bathroom, but I got through the door and grabbed her, Thorpe said. We fell down in a tussle. Marilyn later said the fight was one of her earliest memories. Studio bosses ordered Astor to give up the case. On the last day of filming the movie Dodsworth at MGM, Astor was called into producer Sam Goldwyn's office. When she arrived, all the heads of major movie studios were waiting for her, including Louis B. Mayer, Jack Warner and Harry Cohn. They ambushed Astor, telling her to give up the custody hearing, which they thought could damage the movie industry. Astor wouldn't be intimidated. She said, I'm sorry, gentlemen, but I will proceed with the case as my lawyer has advised me, and left the room. Stunned by her dismissal, someone suggested Goldwyn enforce the morality clause in Astor's contract and fire her. He shook his head. A woman fighting for her child, he said. This is good. When the judge ruled the diaries couldn't be admitted as evidence, Thorpe's lawyers released excerpts to the press. Soon Astor's intimate musings were exposed nationwide. Impatient with the media circus, the judge ordered Astor and Thorpe to work out an agreement, or else. In the end, Astor triumphed, gaining custody of Marilyn for nine months a year. Surprisingly, the scandal didn't hurt Astor's career. She was even more popular afterward, starring in The Maltese Falcon, Little Women and Meet Me in St. Louis. Her career spanned seven decades and includes a lasting legacy as a femme fatale. As for the diaries, the judge ordered them locked away until Marilyn turned 21. In 1952, they were removed and burned. If you like this video, don't forget to give it a thumbs up, subscribe if you are new here, and if you want to support my work, please visit my Patreon page. Now it is your turn.
What do you think about the life and legacy of Mary Astor?